Hello, in this video we're going to look at fractals and an introduction with the basic parts of what we need for creating box plots. So what are fractals? Fractals is a cutoff point for a certain fraction of a sample. So the word fractals comes from fraction. So we have a set of data and we divide it in different fractions. And that result is a measure of position because it tells us where it is in relation to a certain spot in the data set. Um, so common fractals that we're going to discuss are percentile, deciles, and quartiles. So deciles, what are they? Uh, they're a common fractal in which you divide the data set into 10 equal parts. So if you look at this graph, there's 10 different colors we have here, and each one of the, those little boxes represents a data set. And we've divided into each color has the same amount of data values in it. Now, some of them are just spread out taller, some of them are spread out wider, uh, but each color has the same amount of data values. Now, since we have to have in deciles we have to have 10 equal parts now the equal parts means they just have an equal amount of data values uh, then that means we need to have nine cutoffs so when we discuss deciles there's 10 equal parts but there's nine deciles where we have them separated so we have first decile which occurs at where there's 10 percent of the data below second decile there's 20 percent of the data below it and the important part is when you are discussing deciles is that for example if i was discussing the ninth decile that would means that 90 percent of my data is below it and the word decile means 10 percent so nine and ten percent that's 90 percent uh, a few key points about decile, um, your data has to be ranked into 10 equal uh, large subsections. So make sure your data is ranked from lowest to highest value. Um, and then each successive numbers, each successive des uh, decile means that there's an increase of 10 more additional percent of your data. Um, a lot of data ranking is performed uh, with deciles as well as percentiles in a lot of academical and statistical studies uh, for finance and economics. And if you're doing any of that later on in life, deciles will likely show up. Uh, The government often uses deciles to determine the level of income inequality in the country uh, and how it is distributed, and it can help reduce the wage gap and increasing income tax and such things. So it can be a very useful data to collect. Uh, percentiles are very similar to fractiles, but instead of my data set being split up into 10 equal parts it's just split up even more into 100 equal parts so that means we're going to have 99 different um, partitions uh, when we say for example that you're in the 90th percentile that means that 90 percent of the data is below um, so these are represented not by d but instead of p it should be all of p percentiles here So just as with deciles, percentiles, your data has to be ranked from lowest to highest, and you just then split it up into 100 equally large subsections, and that just means that each section has the same amount of data set. And then when we say you're in a certain um, percentile, it just has increased with one more percent of the previous percentile, but it also includes the previous percentile. So if I say you're in the 50th percentile, that means it includes all of the 49% below it as well. Um, and this percentile is used even more academically and 
and all the other methods that we previously discussed, but it can be more work intensive. So deciles is often used when you want to get similar information as percentiles, but do less work. Um, now, an important note to know, percentile is different from percentage. Percentage is how much did you get correct out of 100 versus percentile tells you or whatever data set you're looking at what how much uh how you performed in regards to others who are similar and how much did worse than you so below you what percent is below you so not just how you did out of the total now the fractal we're going to look at the most are quartiles and instead of dividing our data set into 10 or 100 equal parts, we're dividing it into four equal parts. Um, quartiles are, we're going to have three of them because to get four equal parts, we need to have three divisions. And uh, these values are represented by Q1, Q2, and Q3, which means that at Q1, we're going to have 25% of the data below, Q2, 50% of the data below, and Q3, 75% of the data below. couple of key points about quartiles. Again, to calculate your quartiles, we have to have our data from lowest to highest and then split it up into four equal parts. And each increase represents 25% increase. Uh, and we're especially going to use quartiles and they're most helpful when your data is not symmetric or you have outliers. And unlike deciles and percentiles, we're going to actually practice calculating quartiles and using them. And they're an important measure of position uh, as they help us calculate the interquartile range, which is a measure of spread. Uh, and we're just going to discuss that later. Now, if you think of the word quartile, hopefully another word that is similar comes to mind, which is quarter. So quarter just means one fourth, right? So quarter, one fourth, which is why we have four parts, but we're going calling them quartiles because uh, that means that we are you looking at how much all of the data is below. So the median is dividing the data into halves. So um, just like a highway, right? It goes down the middle of the road and the quartiles divide the data into quarters. So we're, to get the median, you're going to have two quarters below or two quartiles below. And the median actually is the same as your second quartile, because at the second quartile, if you recall, that's 50% of my data below. And median just means 50% of the data is below. So to find the quartiles, the first step you need to do is locate the median, which is Q2. Now we're not going to use Q2 to represent median. We're going to write out median or MED. Uh, but just know that Q2 is the same thing as the median. Uh, and once you found the median, you end up with two halves. And each of those halves, you further, further split down in more uh, in another half and a half. And that gives you Q1 and Q3. So let's look at an example. If you look at this example, we have all these 2002 car mi uh, miles per gallon data, and I have split up that data into two equal halves. Now notice 25 and 26, there's not a perfect middle number, but I still include 25 in this half and the 26 in this half. So you have to include, there's no perfect middle number, the two middle numbers still need to be included in each of the halves. So in this case, our Q2 is going to be 25.5 because I just averaged 25 and 26. So 25 plus 26 divided by 2, that gives me 25.5. Now remember, my Q2 or my median was right here. And remember the 25. So if we ignore the upper half to just calculate the lower half median, that will give me my Q1. So again, to calculate the lower quartile, the 25th percentile, I'm going to just calculate the median of the lower half, which in this case is 23. What do you think it is? 
for the upper half. Hopefully you were able to get 28. Now, real quick review, range is the difference between the maximum or highest value and the minimum value. So you calculate range by always doing max minus min, and it tells you how spread, so measure of spread, out the entire data set is. Now a new concept is interquartile range, and it tells you the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. So uh, it tells you how spread out the middle 50% of the data is. And again, this is still a measure of spread, and it, but it just tells you how spread out the data within the Q1 to Q3 is. So it ignores the lower and the upper 25%. Now, why do we care about interquartile range besides knowing how spread out the data is? It's because it can help us calculate outliers. So this is how we calculate outliers, and we're not just approximating or guessing if they are, but we're actually calculating. So first we get the interquartile range, then whatever value we get for interquartile range, we always multiply by 1.5. Now, to get kind of a, a range of where my values are normal and what's considered an outlier, first we need to add this value we got from step two to Q3 and subtract that value from uh, Q1. And that will give us kind of like some fences and within those fences, whatever is included, whichever of my data sets are included are normal, whatever is outside those fences would be not normal and therefore outliers. Let's look at our previous example. We had that these were my lower and upper quartile, and all we have to do is subtract the smaller one from the bigger one, and we get the inner quartile range is five. Now, to get our outliers, we have to take that value and multiply by 1.5 first and foremost. So when we multiply by 1.5, we get 7.5. Now, this 7.5 is what we're going to subtract from 23 and we're going to add it from 28. So we're just going to create a bigger range from those quartiles and see is there anything, so potentially are 13 or 16 outliers, is 31 or 56 outliers, the, do any of these lower values or these upper values fall outside of the new imaginary fences I'm creating? So I'm creating fences for what's normal. So when I multiply, I get 7.5, and then I add it to Q3. So I add it because I'm try just trying to create a bigger range from what's considered the middle 50%. And when I add 7.5 to Q3, I get 35.5. So my cutoff range for my fences, for my upper fence, is 35.5. So if you see, this 56 is considered an outlier because it's bigger than my upper fence. Now, to calculate my lower fence, I have to subtract it from my lower quartile, Q1, and when I do that, I get 15.5. Now, 15.5 would be right here somewhere, and if you look, is 13 an outlier? Yes, it is, because it is lower than my lower fence. In this data set, you can have multiple or no outliers, but to determine that, you have to calculate your inner quartile range, and then your fences. Now, fences are just imaginary, and they're there to help you figure out your data sets. They're not ever going to be used for graphing. They're only used for determining uh, if there's outliers. In the next video, we're going to actually use these concepts to graph our box plots.